I just get a show of hands of how many people are endurance athletes? Okay. Yeah. How many people uh, work with endurance athletes? How many people know an endurance athlete? Okay. So when I say the word we, I want to unite all of us because I'm used to talking to triathletes, so I don't want you guys to feel like you don't relate to this because I created this presentation in a way that us as women can relate to this but also inspire other women as well, regardless if you're an endurance athlete. In 1967, Katherine Schweitzer, she registered for the all-male Boston Marathon. That's her there on the left. Through the simple act of running, she empowered women to be more than just spectators on the sidelines. Then in 1972, women were allowed to run the Boston Marathon. And in 2013, 40% of the finishers were women. On the right there, does anybody know who that is? You've maybe seen the picture? Julie Moss. In 1982, Julie Moss was doing her thesis, and it was the training and physiological requirements of endurance sports. So why not be your own case study? So she participated in the Ironman, which was in Kona. And if you don't know what an Ironman is, it's a 2.4 mile swim, 112 mile bike ride, and then you finish with a marathon. You finish it in one day. You start at seven in the morning and you have till midnight to finish. Everybody starts together, so it's not like you just do it on your own. It's all together. 140.6 miles total that your body has to take you. Now, Julie Moss was leading the race. That was not her goal, but she was talented enough until about one mile from the finish. Her glycogen depleted body just fell to the ground. Every time she would get up, she would run a little bit more and her legs would just buckle beneath her. She couldn't get disqualified. If people touched her, she would get disqualified. So she couldn't have anybody carry her or push her or she didn't want to quit. So the only way she could finish was to crawl. So that's her in her well-known trucker hat crawling across the finish line. She ended up coming in second, 29 seconds behind the leader. Now, even though she, she didn't win the Ironman, she has inspired and motivated men and women through this courageous act of just pure suffering with a glycogen depleted body that anything is possible with the human body. It only takes one woman to raise the bar as to what the female body can do. We have competitive swimming, we have master swimming, we have baseball, we have CrossFit, we have masters running, and we even now have American Ninja Warrior. <laughs> In the past decade, there have been so many amazing accomplishments done by women. And what's great is that they have received national attention by the media. And it's because of women like these, women like you guys, and many other women that were tearing down those traditional gender stereotypes that once involved women. You know, it's really hard to believe that there was a time when our society thought that women shouldn't play competitive sports. And if they did, nobody would want to watch them. So I know that this room is not filled with Ironman triathletes. I'm not expecting you to be an Ironman triathlete. Probably <laughs> we'll talk if you're even considering it. But I want to make sure that you guys can relate to this, but most importantly, you love to use your bodies, you love to inspire other women to use their bodies, and that's why we're here today. So I could talk about all day about how awesome it is to be a woman, but there are a few objectives that I'd like to cover just so you have a better understanding of how the female endurance athlete can be healthy and perform well, because that's the ultimate goal. You want to perform the best that you can, but keep your body in good health. So the first topic is mental toughness. Now mental toughness is something that we all want. Sometimes it's very hard to find, especially when we need it. Now I know as an Ironman athlete that competes for 140.6 miles, there's absolutely no way that I could do the Ironman if I'm not mentally tough. But even to get to the Ironman with all of life's obstacles, I have to be mentally tough through my training and just in life as well. And what's interesting about mental toughness is that we all define it differently. We all use it differently and apply it differently. So just a few people, what I want to know, maybe just two or three people, how do you define mental toughness and how do you use mental toughness? So think about it just for a second. 
Okay, time's up. So <laughs> just maybe two or three people, just tell me what, how you use mental toughness. Tenacity. Tenacity, yeah. And Stick to it, not giving up when you fall down, get, get back up. So not giving up when you fall down. So when you feel like life is over, you get back up again so you don't call yourself a failure. Right, you just gotta keep on going. Yes? I just think about how great it's gonna feel when I can look back and say I've done this. Yep, yeah. I always tell people, there was a time when you couldn't do it, and that's when you wanna look back and say, wow, I, what I just did I couldn't do before. I always think I've been through a lot worse, and you're like, Yeah, 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 yes? As I've gotten older, I think there's also a softness to it, like a love and acceptance of myself, my surroundings, what I can great. control, what I can't. Perfect. Yeah. Good, yes. Um, I just, I kind of leave myself and I just reach to a higher power. Great, love it, yes. I, I share this with my children sometimes when they get fidgety. It's, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, there's a difference between like pain and discomfort, but yeah. like it's okay. Yeah. It's, I can tell you how many times I'm uncomfortable when I'm doing an Ironman. Yeah. And then I see my, my husband races too, and I can see him when he's suffering, and I'm like, oh, I'm not so bad anymore. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, guys. Just a little bit of inspiration. That's, that's all I want to touch on for mental toughness. So I see a lot of similarities between cars and human bodies. They both need fuel to run. Uh, they both need regular tune-ups. They both will run out of gas if you go long distances. Uh, they're not crash-proof. Some of the parts are replaceable, some, some are not. Um, but what's interesting is that cars and human bodies, they both come in lots of shapes and sizes and models. And not always is the car with the sleek, sexy exterior the fastest car, or is it the one that's most practical in terms of safety and overall usage. Now, as an athlete, a female athlete, I can identify with some of the concerns and struggles that female endurance athletes face, but as a professional, I hold a Master of Science in Exercise Physiology, and I'm also a registered dietitian, so I take my job very seriously that I want to help female endurance athletes reach their body composition goals to help them perform better, but above all, I want them to have a healthy relationship with food and their body. The results of this study are a bit shocking, but it doesn't surprise me in this body image obsessed world that with 42% of women that answered this, this study, uh, the survey, that they were normal weight, but almost 80% feel, feel as if their body weight affects their self-image, and 62% say that it impacts their life. Now, for me, you may not know anything about me, but I have an extremely healthy relationship with my body and food. And that was not developed overnight, very many years. And I love to eat for fuel. I love to eat for health, but I also love to eat for pleasure because food tastes good. My husband's from Europe, so you better believe we got a lot of pastries in our house a lot. Of, so, um, and, and that makes me happy. I've developed a diet that allows me to do the things that I want to do and keep me in good health. But also, that relationship that I have with my body is not so much about looks, if at all, but instead what I love about my body and, and what it allows me to do. So from this study and moving forward, I want us to be the voice that tells other women that it's not about what you look like, but instead, all right, listen, body, show me what you can do. So as a coach and as a dietitian, I could give athletes the best training plan I could come up with. I could give them the best fueling plan that I can come up with. But if an athlete, a female athlete, does not have a good relationship with food then in their body, then really the best laid training plan and the best fueling plan really aren't of good use. They're never going to reach their full potential as an athlete. And when it comes to performance-driven female endurance athletes, there is a concern of body image, particularly because athletes have a different standard as to what their body should look like, what they need it to look like. It doesn't mean that they have a distorted body image. It's just they understand the impact of their body. But like I said, if you don't have that good relationship with your food and your body, then you are not going to reach your full potential because you're always going to be focused on a look or an image or a number on the scale instead of thinking, how does my body serve me in life as well as on and off the field or in the gym?
A change in body weight, it doesn't always bring happiness. It, always, it doesn't always bring performance gains. And changing yourself on the outside, it doesn't always make you fitter or faster um, in the inside. Now I realize as a professional that changing the human body, changing the female human body and changing their body composition, if they lose body fat, that yes, you can become healthier, you, can, you have the potential to become a faster athlete, and you also can improve your self-confidence. But there is a very fine line that female athletes can face that as to how much weight they can lose, as well as the methods and how quick until their performance and their health begin to be sabotaged. So again, we should not focus so much on what the human body should look like. There is a broad spectrum of shapes and sizes of female endurance athletes, specifically in triathletes. When you look at athletes of similar sports, they carry similar physiological traits, a swimmer's shoulders, a cyclist's quads, a sprinter's butt, a runner's leg. But when you look at a triathlete, what is a triathlete supposed to look like? You're merging three different sports together. What do you need in a triathlon, especially a long distance triathlon? You need stamina, you need power, you need speed, you need to be efficient, you need to be resistant to fatigue. A lean body is not your missing link. You need to make sure that you're not glycogen depleted, and you're not dehydrated and you pace yourself throughout the race. As far as I know, they are not giving medals to the female who has the lowest body fat percentage at the start of the race, right? It's the athlete that slows down the least. That is what makes a successful endurance athlete. I use this picture in a lot of my talks just because you can see how two athletes at the, very, at the highest level, the Olympic Games, in the exact same sport can have two different bodies. So I'm sure we have all done some body examining, saying, wow, she's ripped, or she's lean, or she, she's so fit, she must be so fast. And perhaps maybe she's behind you, or maybe she's in front of you. But let's think about the basic physiology 101. A body looks a certain way and performs a certain way based on how it's trained, how it's fueled, and good recovery. So your body will naturally change by doing the right things as you chase performance and not a look. We need to stop these bubbles. Body image is getting in the way of health, happiness, and performance, and overall quality of life. Does anybody know? Anyone who has these bubbles above them, their heads? Anybody here maybe at times? I want you to pop them right now. <laughs> pop. And if you hear someone and you see that they have these bubbles, I want you to pop those bubbles. So we need to stop the body bashing, the extreme exercise, the extreme dietary habits. And we have to show with our voice and most importantly with our actions as to what our quality, how our quality of life is improved when we have a healthy relationship with food and the body. So now on to a topic that I think most people in this room can relate to is strength training. Now some triathlon coaches believe that strength training does not have a, plan, uh, a purpose in a triathlete's training plan. It's cardio focus. A lot of triathletes just do not want to strength train. They would much rather just swim, bike, and run. But as you guys can imagine, that you absolutely 100% have to swim, bike, and run to be prepared for a triathlon. You cannot just strength train. You have to put in the work in the pool and the bike and the run. But strength training, not only does it help you, or not only does it have a place in triathlon training, but it can help maximize your performance. The problem with so many triathletes is that they have this great training plan and then the coach writes down 30 minutes of strength training. The triathlete doesn't really know what to do with it or they come to you as a personal trainer and they say, my, my coach told me I need to strength train or I read that I need to strength train. And then you say, well, what do I do? So some athletes do DVDs, core classes, body pumps. Some athletes jump into CrossFit, TRX. But the problem with these is that it's not specific. 
And the most important thing with strength training is that it has to have a specific progression that will yield results that will transfer into swim, bike, and run um, performance gains. When you think about the human body and what it's required to do in an Ironman, it, it's really just unbelievable the, how it all has to work together and, and what is required to take your body for hours, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 17 hours of racing. Now, Ironman triathletes, they don't need to be strong just to be strong. We're not out there to see how much we can lift in a gym. That's not our goal. Our goal as Ironman triathletes is to, to be as resistant to fatigue as possible. That's what helps us out on race day. So like I said before, successful triathletes, the most successful one is who slows down the least. And lastly, there's nothing that really proves that strength training will prevent injuries in triathletes, but certainly by improving your range of motion and your form and helping muscles get stronger, you can reduce the risk. So just going through a few phases of strength training, the first one is just your form and range of motion phase. And triathletes will absolutely hate this phase because it's boring. And the reason why is a lot of these is you're relearning movements or you're teaching your body how to go through movements properly. And ultimately this will reduce the risk of injury if you can focus on these specific movements at the beginning. A lot of athletes get really good at doing exercises wrong. And I think that's one thing with runners. A lot of people can just jog and walk faster and then you can run. And that's what's great about running. It doesn't require a lot of skills, but you can learn how to do things incorrectly and then it can backfire <coughs> later on. So with this phase, it's several times per week and it's beyond their off season. I am in my off season right now and I am doing absolutely nothing. And I love it. I, if you saw my lifestyle right now, you would not think that I'm an athlete. I'm staying up late, I'm sleeping in, and if I feel like exercising, I will exercise. My dog gets a lot of walks. That's pretty much it. And I will do this for six weeks. I will probably start to get a little antsy around four to five weeks, but I'm absolutely enjoying this rest right now, and my heart and my body and my brain need it. So once they get into this phase, this is typically for the United States, the American athlete who has their season in the warmer months here, that this will be in a transition phase, which will usually be January-ish timeframe, and they will do this for eight to 12 weeks. And these are very basic movements, and we wanna focus on isolated movements, and then as they get stronger and do these through good range of motions, then you can add more um, load, decrease the reps, and then make it more powerful and more sports specific. So my favorite exercise is step-ups. But before you learn how to do a step up, you want to learn how to stand on one leg. And a lot of women will just bend their hip out. And I did this too because my glute medius was never working. Sometimes women have two bad glute medias, but a lot of times it's just one glute med that is just not firing. And so then they have a lot of piriformis problems and IT band and TFL and SI joint. And it's really hard to overcome that. And then a physical therapist says, we need to work on your glute med, and they're like, well, I'm doing lots of clams, and I'm doing these step-ups, and I'm doing hip hikes and everything, but that glute med is not turning on. Well, let's focus on this phase, and let's just teach you how to stand so that you can just turn on that glute med without doing any other complex movements. Maybe even close your eyes and see if you can, you know, neuromuscularly tap into some of those things that once you do your step-ups, you will have good range of motion. The next one is probably a lot of athletes' favorite. It's more of plyometrics. So getting your heart rate up, a lot of athletes like that. You don't really do much by just standing on one leg. But these movements are more complex. So if a triathlete comes to you as a trainer and says, I need a strength train, you wanna make sure that you, they've spent that time on that form and range of motion before you get them doing plyometrics or more dynamic exercises. Now, it is important that during this phase that you keep in mind as a trainer or as an athlete that you may have some tune-up races. So maybe your key race is in June, July, August, but you may have a tune-up race. Sometimes we call those B races or C races. 
you know, C, less importance, B, practicing things, pacing, nutrition, and you may not be as fresh. Don't want to take away strength training. You may need to modify it a little bit, but just keep that in mind that you're probably not going to feel the best. And certainly we want to reduce the risk for injury too, so we need to find some balance. This is usually the phase when triathletes say, I'm stopping strength training. See ya, coach, <laughs> strength training coach. I need to train now. And, and that's good with good reason because during this time, you're increasing your volume, you're increasing your intensity depending on what race you're training for. You need to be fresh for your cardio workouts or it's ju you're just not gonna have good workouts. And psychologically, you need to have good workouts when you're swim, biking, and running. So we wanna call this the maintenance phase. It could be one day a week or even two, depending on the athlete, where you just tap into some of those systems that they trained. And this should make sense that if an athlete can't do plyometrics as they're getting ready for a race, then maybe they're just overtrained. You know, if they can't do these simple sports specific exercises that they've worked for 16, 20 weeks for, there, something is wrong. So we want to encourage athletes that it is okay to continue these exercises because you're just keeping yourself fresh for race day. So just to summarize, the exercises should be very simple. Triathletes have a lot of things on their plate. They really don't want to make the time to go to the gym all the time. They're, they have a lot to do and, and their family as well. So if you can minimize the complexity of how they do this and maybe even at their home, that's great. Doesn't have to be long. Short exercises are much better, or sessions are much better than the long sessions in terms of maximizing that time. I always encourage athletes to spend five or 10 minutes a day on their core, hip, lower back, and after this conference, I will encourage the breathing techniques as well. We need to keep in mind this has to be integrated into a cardio focused, so it needs to enhance the cardio. It shouldn't take away from the cardio. It must be progressive and sports specific. And lastly, I encourage athletes, no matter what sport, to do some type of dynamic exercise, light foam rolling. And when I tell my athletes foam rolling is warming up the muscles, but also being aware of any hot spots. Just be aware of what you're the feedback that your body is giving you. And then I think it's good for people to stretch in the evening before bed, especially their neck, their back, their lower back. I have just a simple routine and I do it before I go to bed every day, every night. And um, I think it helps my hips out the most by stretching my back because I tend to be a little more broad up here and I carry a lot of weight upper body and I've had my share of hip problems. So next topic. <laughs> Now, when it comes to research, and I think we've talked about this, when it comes to sports nutrition and exercise physiology research, a lot of it, if not all, is applied to male subjects. So our, our topics on training techniques, recovery, sports nutrition, it's mostly applied to men and then taken to females. Here's our research. Here you go, female. I think our boobs give us away, but we're not small men. Now, Stacey Sims, who had that quote there, um, she's one of the leading female researchers when it comes to the physiology of women in terms of menstruation, um, hormone changes, and then alterations in their metabolism. I have also learned a lot from Cass as well. I think she is definitely an expert when it comes to menstruation also. Now, before I go into this, and this isn't gonna be a heavy loaded topic because I'm not an expert in this area and it just intrigues me to learn more about this, I don't even think the top researchers in menstruation really understand it that much. So I'm certainly not an expert. But I do wanna say that it is not okay, normal, or even exciting to lose your period as a female endurance athlete. I started endurance triathlons in 2006 and since 2008, because I was working with Cassandra a little bit, because it was big overload for my body to be an endurance athlete. Since 2008, and eight Ironmans later, I've had a regular cycle for my period every month, and, um, and no changes at all in terms, or obviously I've become a better athlete, but no changes with my menstrual cycle at all. And lucky me, I even got my period two days before Ironman Wisconsin three weeks ago. And it was my first time dealing with that, my poor husband. My cramps were horrible. <laughs> he just felt so bad. But I'd be happy to answer any questions about how fun that is. So I do want to say that amenorrhea, it occurs in all sports, even super, super lean runners 
They can have regular menstrual cycles and, and basketball players, female basketball players can lose their menstrual cycle. So don't just assume that it's uh, um, associated with their body composition. Restrictive eating and too much of a training load are kind of those key red flags as to why women may be losing their cycle. There's many, there could be many other underlying problems, but in female endurance athletes, this is something that we need to be aware of. If a female endurance athlete is not meeting their metabolic needs, then their hormones are affected. And then lastly, we have to keep in mind that losing your period could be a triad of problems with disordered eating, as well as leading into osteoporosis as well. And this will end your career, so we don't want to have this happen. So just to summarize that your cycle is typically 28 days. Your menses start at the beginning, and this low hormone follicular phase is during the beginning, and most people have their period for three to five days, sometimes it's seven, but then you have this shift of hormones, and then you get into the luteal phase. And I'm sure we... have a three-day period. Huh? I know. <laughs> I, actually, I actually do, but I do. But it, it's kind of light towards the end, but it is absolutely horrible horrible the first day. Absolutely horrible. So I'd rather it be spread out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'd rather it be spread out and be happy and my body be lovely, but it's not. It's horrible. Um, yeah, and now I'll talk about some training stuff. Um, and, then, and then we all know what it feels like to be in the high hormone phase for f half of the month, every month. Yeah. So uh, just some things that I want to discuss and what I want to say before I go into this is this absolutely does not apply to every woman and I don't fit this mold either and I will summarize at the end. So the low hormone phase that um, you will, estrogen decreases the reliance on liver glycogen so you are really primed to burn fat. So I usually tell them when my athletes come to me, oh I have my period, I'm like this is a good time to work out. So just, you're using a lot of body fat, not from body image issues, I'm just like, you know, you got a lot of fuel you can use so I just got to get them out the door and you feel pretty crappy but you get out there. Also, you um, decrease your amino acid breakdown so you could have a chance to recover a little bit faster. So because of this, you sweat a little bit better, you tolerate heat a little bit better. So the takeaways of this is that if you are racing during the, uh, the follicular phase, or at least during your period, you may choose hotter races. You may be okay during those races um, or hotter climates. Also more power and intensity. So if you're doing a short distance race as a tune-up, this may be a good time uh, to add that intensity. But also you're built to do endurance because that's a steady state exercise. Um, and carbohydrate, because you are burning more uh, fat for fuel, you, you still need carbohydrates, but there can be some fluctuation in terms of how much you need that you may not need as much, but you do need carbohydrates. Then in the high hormone phase, boy, doesn't it look fun to race in this phase. So you have increased respiration, decreased plasma volume, you've got redistribution of fluid, more protein catabolism, elevated core temperature. So what are some things, takeaways from this? If you're racing in a really hot race, you may not be able to sweat as much. I wrote in my race report, I didn't get into the specifics that I was on my period. I have a lot of male readers, but I will blog about it. My face felt so hot the whole race. And it, in Wisconsin, it was only like 75, 77. It was a perfect day, but I just felt so hot in my face. And I'm not a big sweater anyways, but I just felt like I couldn't cool myself. So imagine if I was in Hawaii for the World Championships, but we'll get into that as well. Also, th there is a risk, I spelled injury wrong, injury risk, and, um, and I've known for myself that I feel more aches and pains, especially because I have a lot of hip problems um, during this time. So that's just something that I've learned about myself. The psychological aspect of bloating is something that really is I want to stress because when you're bloated, you don't want to eat water retaining carbohydrates. You want to eat salads and things that make you feel clean inside, but you have to have your carbohydrates. So you need to figure out what foods work best for you because you don't want to neglect those water retaining foods that you need to help you perform the best. Lastly, 
I'll speak on two different things. For anti-inflammatories, no endurance athletes should be taking anti-inflammatories at least two days before the race, the morning of the race, or during the race. We have to stop this. It can increase renal damage. It can also increase um, dehydration. And also you have hyponatremia risks from it as well, and you don't recover as well. So here's the problem with women who have their menstrual cycle. I'm sure for a lot of people that never even take anti-inflammatories, this is the time. I know for myself that I need some type of anti-inflammatory because of stomach pains or back pains. So when I did Ironman Wisconsin, I didn't take any and I just felt horrible, but I didn't want to compromise my health because of what my healthy body was doing. Lucky me. So a few takeaways, understand your body and your cycle, plan your training and racing the best that you can, keep a journal, discuss your options just because you don't have to deal with the ha hassle of having your period and, and losing blood, you will still experience a shift of hormones. So don't just think because you're on a pill that you won't have these hormones. Be prepared psychologically. I think that's the most important thing. When I did Wisconsin, I knew that I was gonna get my period. Uh, so I prepared myself. I was hoping it would come Tuesday or Wednesday. And of course it had to come like two days before the race. So I just psychologically, but uh, and mentally I just felt like this is what I have to deal with. And I'm not gonna change a lot. I'll change a little bit, but in terms of my hydration strategy, but other than that, I didn't change anything because I just had to let my body do its thing. And, and I knew from experience too that by the third day, I'm pretty good. And so just uh, two takeaways I wanna take away, take from myself is that I've had some of my best races in my luteal phase. I've had some of my best performances 10 or five days out from getting my period. I've also had some of my best high intensity workouts during my follicular phase. So the second or third day of my period, I have really great high intensity workouts like on the track um, or if I'm doing like a um, high intensity run. So understand your body and lastly, just be in, keep in mind that there's no decrease in performance. People have won Olympic medals on their period. So don't feel that you're just doomed because you have your period. So my last two topics are on nutrition. And I think we can all agree that 100% nutrition enhances performance. If you don't fuel your body properly, then your risk of injury, burnout, glycogen depletion, it all goes up. So we need to make sure that as fitness enthusiasts or even as endurance athletes that we eat properly. If, an, if a body is not supported with good nutrition, then no amount of gym time, no amount of sports nutrition is gonna help take your body to that next level. So a few things to remember, and I want to, without going on about registered dietitians, but it is not within your scope that you have to give people nutrition advice. You have experience, you have good knowledge, and people probably ask you these things. But if you're a strength and conditioning coach or a personal trainer, that's your scope of practice. And you can absolutely give people advice to make sure that they are eating healthy because we have lots of information. But when it comes to fueling the athlete's body, when it comes to vitamins and minerals, there's a reason why there's a higher education that is required because there's a lot of experts out there and when we all are within one scope of education, when we all have the same textbooks, the same exams, the same learning, then we learn things similarly. Once we get that credential, we can do whatever we want. And that's where some confusion is. But if everybody becomes an expert, that's when it gets very confusing for the public, for us. So. I am focusing all my attention on fueling the endurance athlete. I'm not focusing on strength training. I'm not focusing on other areas, psychology. I'm focusing on my passion. So just keep that in mind that you don't have to be a nutrition expert. There's other people out there. And now I know lots of you, so I will refer my athletes to you guys and other people as well, because that's what we do. We're here for the, the athlete or the client itself. So the first thing is making sure the balanced diet is healthy. And, and what is healthy, it can be defined many different ways, but I wanna make sure that the athlete has a healthy body composition, okay? Not too much, not too little. Support their immune system and reduce the risk for disease. 
Okay, if you're sick and overtrained, you're not going to perform very well. Then we want to make sure that they have a, they time their nutrition properly with their workouts. Now, number one and number two, they don't have to be done in this order. Lastly, you tweak their sports nutrition as they progress with their training load, and you should always consider variables that will affect their ability to eat healthier to perform well. And there's many of them, I just listed a few. So as far as research goes, athletes do not need specific vitamins and minerals higher than the general population. They wanna take a multivitamin, that's fine. But there are a few nutrients that athletes need to make sure they stay up on. But because athletes don't need more vitamins and minerals, that's because they just need more food. And when you eat more food, you get more vitamins and minerals. So you don't need to eat low calorie and then eat, have vitamin C to protect your immune system. No, you just need more food and you will get that from a real food diet. So just a few things to keep in mind and you guys don't have to worry about the amounts, but if you are working with somebody and, and they, or yourself, you wanna make sure that I, on the bottom there that you have enough protein, carbohydrates, and fat. And fat is so important in an athlete's diet. Why? Because they're hungry all the time and they need to eat a lot of calories. So fat is really good. It makes food taste good. It helps with the hormones as well. Is that the spectrum of fats as well? Like do you have the fat breakdown into like the polyimono? No. Like, no. Yep, just, and I never give athletes meal plans or talk about grams, so I really just think about the composition of that meal, that if you looked at it as a, as a pie graph, that you would have some type of fat, healthy fats, even cheese, things like that, but something that has fat in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, just because there's more research to show that carbohydrates and protein should be identified based on their body weight, whereas hopefully if you get those up and you have an idea of how much calories they can be eating, then fat can be added in there. Because as an athlete, obviously carbohydrates are very important and so is protein, especially for recovery and amino acids. But fat, because fat, it's needed, but it's not your in a dietary sense, it's not a fuel source. You just want to make sure that you have a healthy diet. And also fat is the first thing to go when you have sports nutrition. You want a low fat, low fiber. So that's why we, I stress it at their meals, that they have fat at their meals. So if you don't know, I am a vegetarian. I am a plant strong athlete for 22 years. I was 10 years old, way before it was cool to be a vegetarian. I just didn't want to kill animals anymore. And I told my mom that she, ah, she'll grow out of it. And I'm still a plant strong athlete. I have absolutely no trouble with it. My husband's cool with it. He's not a vegetarian, but he eats what I cook. So there are a few things. People, a long time ago, I think probably once I started getting good at Ironman, they stopped asking me where I got my protein from. <laughs> so I never get that question anymore. And I can list you tons of protein options that I eat every day. And the only thing that differs for me and my husband, because we're both plant strong athletes, is our protein choices. But for vegan and vegetarian athletes, you do want to make sure that they have these foods that may be lacking, these nutrients that may be lacking in their plant strong diet. And it is important, especially for the vegan athlete, because it's very hard to eat a lot of calories as a vegan. And even for myself, I eat so many fruits and vegetables because I love them. But I have to have a right distribution so that I'm not so full on volume and fiber that I don't have room for carbohydrates. Because I love my grains and starches and I love my fats. So you want to create that nice di diet that has a little bit from each of the groups. Neutrally restrictive diets. So there's many reasons why people may be restricted in some way beyond just their own choices. So you need to consider your own choices or somebody else's as to why they may not be meeting their needs. And then you wanna make sure that you foremost address the timing. Snacks are great to fill in the gaps between the day. And this is a uh, supplement is to supplement the diet. So unless you have some lab work to show that you need some other vitamin and mineral, then you could address supplements, but you can get everything from a real food diet and then address what you may be missing. Also in terms of supplements like bars and, and shakes and things like that, 
then those can be added too because maybe you just need extra nutrients that you just can't get in the real food diet or traveling. So we need to accept those things that those are okay. Progress, not perfection. We always want to work on a good, better, best system. Don't just tell an athlete to do something that they've never done before because they don't know how it's going to make them feel. So if an athlete is not, let's say, eating plain yogurt with strawberries on top because you feel like it's the healthiest snack for them, then say, well, can you eat you know, one of those uh, pre-made yogurt drinks you know, that are marketed to kids and for calcium? And then maybe can you move to flavored yogurt? And then when they get that down, then they say, oh, you know, I can do plain yogurt with strawberries on top. It's not so hard. Always make sure they have a good relationship with food. And I think the last one's really important because a lot of athletes just have intolerances to food around workouts. So if an athlete says, I can't do dairy, then you need to make sure they understand that maybe you can't do dairy around a workout, but maybe you can have it later in the day. So sometimes they know that, sometimes you need to work with them on that. All right, last topic here, this is my favorite topic, is sports nutrition. So what is the difference between healthy eating and sports nutrition? Well, one is the food that you eat around workouts to support intentional training stress. That's sports nutrition. The light switch goes off and then you have daily nutrition. I'm a big advocate for real food all day. I cook all my meals and I love taking pictures of food. I love healthy eating. But when it comes to my workouts, I still focus on real food around my workouts, but then sports nutrition products during a workout. I'm not making my own sports nutrition products. I don't have time or a, a lab to do that. The benefits, there's many benefits of sports nutrition. So what are some of the concerns that I hear from female endurance athletes as to why they're not fueling properly? Well, certainly we would want them to focus on performance gains. That should be the main reason why you want to fuel during your workouts. I don't need it, sugar is bad, it has too many chemicals, GI issues, you don't like the taste of it, it's too overwhelming to understand sports nutrition. I want to lose weight, there's conflicting messages, um, my body image, and too many experts. Do you guys hear a lot of these? Any that I left off? Nope, okay, good, I covered them all. So I thought about how I would finish this presentation. I thought, well, maybe I would talk about myself, and I'm going to do that in a minute, but give some of my own tips and advice and things that I give my athletes to help them gain the competitive edge and minimize GI distress. And But then I was like, well, I don't really know why female endurance athletes aren't fueling, because I hear these things, and I see them do this, and my athletes are pretty good because I make them do it, but I just don't understand female endurance athletes endur how they're fueling. So I created a survey. Now I'm not an expert, I didn't get paid to do this, so my results are not 100%, so please don't quote my percentages. I'll share this on my blog so you guys, I'll, I'll break it all down as well. But I was really surprised to see what these athletes responded. Now, thanks to social media, I had 240 female endurance athletes do this, and I just posted it on my blog, and then I sent it to my athletes. So it went all over, certainly did not go viral, but I had pro athletes fill it out, and I had newbies and everybody in between. So for the first time, I'm gonna show you the results. <laughs> I really need some help reading Excel spreadsheets, so <laughs> my results are not, I didn't forge the results in any way, but they, they could answer many different ways, so I tried to do the best I can to analyze this. So who was my, the most popular is people who are here for more than six years as athletes. Now there's a lot to be said for that because when you're an endurance athlete for many years, you really get to know your body and what works for you. The average age grouper, not too fast, not too slow, was on there. I did have seven professionals. And then the most popular sport was half Ironman. And the reason why I asked the sport was because I wanna look at and see if runners do things differently than triathletes. And they should in some aspect, but I just wanted to understand their thinkings. I had three 60 plus year olds and I actually coached some athletes that are above 60. And the average age was 30 to 39. So I think that gives a good demographic of the average athlete as well. Even though in endurance sports, you do seem to peak later than in more powerful sports. So body composition. I don't use BMI when I, when I work with athletes, but I just thought it would be the easiest tool to use. So certainly, you can be 150 pounds and be in the healthy range at many different heights. So 
something, I mean, technically I'm overweight according to scale, so I don't really like to, to use BMI, but for the purpose of this exam, the majority were of healthy weight. Um, a few were below 18 and a half. I would say there was a mix of runners and triathletes there. I asked them, does your body weight affect, limit your performance? It was pretty even, about half and half with yes and no. So then I looked into this a little bit more as to who said that their body weight affects their performance. And of those who said yes, they were of the healthy range. But like I said, we don't really know where, where they are, and certainly this is very subjective. Then of people who said that no, it doesn't affect their performance, they are also of the healthy range. So I think this goes back to the body image talk that just ex accepting your body because a lot of women, I asked them to go into this and they said that my body, you know, it performs really well but sometimes I think that I should be lighter and I forget that, that I'm performing just fine. I don't think I would perform better lighter because I like to be powerful so that helps me out. So of people who said that they wanted to lose weight, that it affected their performance, I said, how much weight do you feel you need to lose? And the majority said five to nine pounds. Now, do you think that's most people? You know, yeah, I've got about five pounds I wanna lose, maybe 10 pounds. Will that five pounds really, like, it's hard to say, but five pounds, you know? You could have five pounds of muscle that you could gain as well. Then body weight affects performance of the people who said no, the majority said that they wanted to lose less than five pounds. So there was still that idea of, I wanna lose weight. Um, I don't wanna lose weight, but if I did, it would just be a few pounds. So I asked people, how often do you think about your body image? Daily, it's always on my mind. And then I was very happy to see that there was a lot that says every now and then, but it doesn't affect how I train or eat. And I do wanna give some credit to the people that responded this, in this because when they said daily, I looked at their responses, why? And they said, because I wanna be healthy or I wanna perform well. So it wasn't always because I'm fat, I'm chubby, you know, all these negative body vocabulary words that I don't want women to use. So it wasn't always negative. And then why do female athletes feel pressure? I was so shocked on this because I really thought it was because of the media but it's because of comparing to other successful athletes, but I know successful athletes use social media a lot. So I don't know if they just have this image of a body because they saw it on Instagram and Twitter and that's their image of somebody holding their shirt up, showing their abs or you know, somebody in really skin tight clothing, if that's their image of the ideal athlete. So since becoming an athlete, I'm focused on my diet because I want to be faster and fitter. You can see the other responses that I put here. I was actually surprised because a lot of endurance athletes say they've gained weight since training for endurance sports. And we talked about that earlier, but it wasn't the number one response. So I was, I was a bit surprised, and, but I was happy with this response. The diet, so I asked, well, this is a, such a horrible question because there's never just one response and the female athletes were glad to tell me that this was a really bad question. <laughs> But I was happy that they did say that you should eat before and after workouts and during. Does everyone do this? Absolutely not. But they did say that this is the best advice. And certainly it is, along with working with a sport RD. And they had some other things. Don't starve. Good advice. So what's the best advice to lose weight? This was very interesting. And I think there's a huge takeaway from this, in my opinion. Late night snacking. Does anybody feel super hungry in the evenings? Like snack overload, right? Well, I don't feel really hungry in the evenings. I don't overeat in the evenings, but boy, have I nailed down my nutrition around my workouts. The best that I can, I'm feeling my needs. I also accept that as an athlete, I need to eat more. I eat more in the afternoon. I also allow room in the evening for a snack. So I think there's two things in this one in that athletes are under fueling and they're hungry, but they feel like they shouldn't eat more. And then two is that they're just not eating enough and they see it as bad. I'm snacking too much. So I think there's some, some things to learn from this. So I wanna help more athletes with that. 
They get most of their information from websites. It's quick. Now this was interesting and there's a reason why the male and female don't add up is just because people could pick different things. So I kind of touched on this before about the experts, but most people said they worked with a sport RD. I'm quite surprised, and I was talking with Dr. Kleiner about this because I didn't know there was that many sport RDs that work with endurance athletes. So I'm, I'm very surprised on this because when athletes come to me or I hear of them, they're not talking about sport RDs. So I don't think it's well defined as to what a sport RD is. And then they're a nutrition expert, and they give fueling tips for athletes. But the last one is they're not an expert, but they've had personal success. Now what's interesting is that these women in those last two, that male percentage is very high, and that's numbers, not percentage, but that 22 out of, and 41. So what that's telling me is for female endurance athletes that there's a large number of males that are just experts, that don't have the necessary the education, not saying that they're bad, giving advice to women. This isn't a bad thing, but I do think that this is putting a lot of confusion into the female as to how she should be fueling her body. Yes? When you say just experts, are you saying self-proclaimed experts versus they're really experts? Yeah, I would call a really expert as someone who has the credential in terms of having a master's or an, a registered dietitian degree. You can certainly be an expert and have a certification or call yourself an expert because you've been on the news and you've written articles for magazines. So that word is used very loosely and, and I think that there's just not a lot of um, similarities in terms of the information that's applied. Certainly I, I just moved but I have a license to practice nutrition so if someone sues me I have things to back myself up. I hope no one does but I, I really take my credential very seriously in terms of ethics and morals and, and things. I, there's a big ethics with my degree that I have to abide to when I give information as well. And CEUs on top of it all. So endurance performance. Now this, just a few more slides here. Endurance performance. This was very interesting because I only use sports nutrition during my longest workouts. There's many reasons, waking up early, you're rushing out the door, I don't feel I need it because I do shorter workouts during the week. You should absolutely be using sports nutrition for all your workouts and I'll get into this just real quick at the end. Now what's interesting is that those who said they only use it during their long workouts also said I always use it in my races just like I do in training. So I think that there's some there's some confusion as to when you need to use your sports nutrition. And then fueling strategy, I have great workouts, but I think I could fuel more. And actually, I, I feel like I'm on there too because I, I keep wanting to fuel more, but I'm trying to find that fine line by not having GI distress and then pacing myself. So I, I still want to fuel more. I love fueling myself. And then I'm doing the right things. They use it to improve their performance. And what's interesting is for the top ones, it's not necessary, sugar is bad, and only electrolytes are needed, and only water is needed. That makes me so upset that athletes feel that that's how they should think. Endurance athletes. The majority of those people were Ironman athletes, there's only a few, and also above the age of 40. Now I know my mom doesn't really get it why I use sports nutrition, and there's a lot of moms out there or adults. So I, I get there could be a learning curve there, but I think as a professional, I need to find a way to make sure that they know 100% this is so damaging for their body if they don't use sports nutrition. There's nothing cool about getting through a, a 20 mile run with just water, not at all. So the modifications, I wanna be able to help athletes now. So if I give them advice on how to feel better, what, what are their limiters, GI upset, and they feel they're doing just fine. And most of them just don't know how to fuel, which I'm surprised because we have so many articles and books and the research really hasn't changed a lot. So I think there's a body image component still that women are hanging on to. And then the final thoughts that uh, the second most popular is that most people felt that they, their workouts are good, but they think they can fuel more. So just a few takeaway tips as I finish up my presentation. You wanna think about how your daily diet affects your training nutrition. 
You also want to remember that your nutrition around your workouts helps you perform. Always work your way up with nutrition. So if you have never used nutrition before, just start with 100 calories per hour. You're burning like 600, so it's a very small amount. But work your way up so you feel comfortable with what you're doing. It takes time to train your gut. Don't just think that you can just start popping things in your mouth when you're running and you're, you're some people have these iron guts, but a lot of people don't. It takes time to get your gut used to it and to say, I need to take in nutrition when I just, I just want to stop eating right now. And it happens. And then when you have an off day, you need to think about why you're having an off day to repair, to replenish, to recharge, to get going again. So your nutrition really shouldn't change a lot, but think about it as you, you don't have to fuel for the workout you're not doing. A well-designed balance keeps you healthy. A well-designed fueling plan helps you perform better. And your body composition is based on how you train and fuel yourself and understand what food works best for you as an athlete. And then if you're concerned, go see a sports dietitian and work with them over time. So I think we just have a few minutes, so I just wanna just quickly go over what I have during the Ironman. So I did Ironman Wisconsin in 10 hours and 44 minutes. I was third age group, six amateur. And what's really interesting is that my husband did 944 and he was also third age group. So we're exactly an hour and third and we both qualified for Kona together. And that was our dream. So dream come true. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And this will be my fourth Kona and my husband's first. So I'm like the old timer here. <laughs> We just did Ironman Austria about the end of June, so like 16 weeks ago. That was my personal best time there. So we don't chase times, we chase our competition, so every course is different, but I'm pretty proud of our Austria. My husband did 922, and he ran a 311. He's a cyclist turned triathlete, so I still got him on the swim. So, <laughs> um, so just pre pretty much to summarize, two nights before a race, I have pizza. It's kind of more of a comfort thing. I love pizza before a race. My, butt, my husband has pasta. That's kind of just our thing. Um, the night before a race, I used to do sweet potato. I switched to jasmine rice just because it's a little less of volume to pack more carbohydrates. And I usually eat that pretty early. It could be three o'clock or four o'clock in the afternoon. And I like to have pancakes in the morning. So I usually, for me and my athletes, we do our carb rich meal in the morning, not in the evening, just more time and then snack throughout the day. Lots of water, but we're not camels. We don't need to overhydrate. Um, also, we can't take supplements that allow us to store more water, like sodium bicarb. It's illegal so, or not allowed in our sport. So just drink enough water to be hydrated. So in the morning, I, I don't do the typical oatmeal or bagel. I do really well with really thin carbohydrates, and then I can dress them up. So a rice cake and wasa crackers, they don't have much calories in them, but they're really easy to dress up with syrup and granola and banana and uh, a little bit of peanut butter as well. So I can easily get 500 calories of low volume carb dense foods. My husband, he does different things, so works for him. Um, nothing in the swim, except for maybe the water I swallow. Uh, during the bike, I take about 300 calories. Um, I'd love to do more, but right now this, this works for me, but I got a whole nother year to train. Um, I don't eat a lot of solid food. I use, think of those as tummy satisfiers. So I, do, I encourage more liquid hydration because you just grab a bottle and all your nutrition is there. You don't have to deal with a bunch of different things on your bike. Um, so over the course of my five hour and 40 minute bike ride, I had 1700 calories. I think I can take that up a little bit more and 168 ounces. I actually dropped one bottle at the end. It popped out of my cage. So I was a little upset. I mean, I was almost at the end, but I probably would have liked to have about 10 ounces more and maybe 100 calories more, but those things. Yeah, Master Aminos. So I have master aminos. I, I think amino acids are really good. Obviously, I don't tell them for all my athletes, and I never push supplements. So I, if they need them, I recommend them. Uh, so, but we do, me and my husband do take aminos during it. I'm not very good with pills. I forget to take them during training and racing. So I'm very um, ad lib as terms of when I take them. Thanks for asking. Then on the run, it's very hard to get nutrition in on the run. So do your best on the bike because it's 
very, very hard physiologically to take in nutrition. I'm guessing I had about 800 calories, primarily just from the nutrition I carry in flasks when I run. So I have them in my hand flasks. So you can see I hold, I hold my nutrition instead of carrying it around my waist. My husband has a fuel belt. So I just hold my nutrition and I can, at special needs, I can grab more. Um, and then I just grab some Coke at the aid stations. Seems to sit the best. And, um, and Coke. That tastes good, huh? Yeah, it does. I'm, some people swear by it. So for me, it's just a nice change in my mouth. Um, so it's a little refreshing, but they had some really like cheap brand Coke <laughs> on there. I looked at, I was running and I saw the bottle and I was like, really? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I have a little caffeine because I create through a, the company that I use my sports nutrition with. I create my own product through sliders and I have about 50 milligrams per hour on the bike. I cannot do more than that. My stomach gets upset and I do not do any caffeine. I don't feel endurance athletes need caffeine before in terms of like coffee is fine, but no like boosters or things like that. It absolutely upsets my stomach, so I can't do anything. During the run, I probably have about 50 or 60 milligrams per hour of caffeine. Um, and, but I do a good job with the amino acids so I don't get much brain fatigue. And I think that's why a lot of people do um, a lot more caffeine as they get really tired and really sleepy. But my amino acids and caffeine make up for, or calories make up for that. So about 2,500 2, calories all day, no, no meals until probably midnight um, when I can tolerate it. And so when I look at how many calories I may be expending, could be more, but I'm pretty small, six, 7,000 calories I'm expending, it's about 40%. Um, you don't need to replace everything. Some people could, but you want to replace enough to keep yourself from being glycogen depleted. So just to summarize my talk today, make sure you have good mental toughness. Make sure, hashtag thank your body. I always do that. Uh, strength training, get stronger to get faster and then go longer. Understand your cycle. Make sure you eat for fuel and for health and fuel for health and performance. So thank you guys so much.